Okay. Yes, ma'am. You're welcome. It it's, it's actually starting. So you're, uh, according to African time, you're on time. <laughs> go, ma'am, go in, please. Yes. Yes. Anyway. You're welcome. Yes. Hello and good afternoon. Um, good afternoon to all the friends and the family who gathered here today. We really apologize for a little bit of um for your well, we're grateful for your patience and apologize for this little bit of a late start. Uh, we're just about to begin. And before I introduce us, I will just let you all know where the bathrooms are. Um, if anyone needs to use the bathroom, the washroom, it's just literally follow the path all the way around the house and take your first left and the bathrooms, the washrooms right will be right there. We invite the family of Yabanga to please come down. And we ask all of you to please come a little closer. Let's, it's a day to celebrate and, and be a little bit closer together. I'd request the people who are sharing wonderful hugs to please come and take your seats. Um, additionally, anyone who will be reading a tribute or presenting weed, ask you to be closer. Yeah, definitely. Please try. There's a lot of um, chairs in the here in the front row, so please try and be closer so that you can get up onto the podium quite quickly. So my name is Judy Kibinger. I will be one part of hosting this occasion to remember and honor Binyavanga Wainaina alongside Ambassador Martin Kimani a long time friend of, of Binya, Binya Bangawainaina. We're here, all of us, dressed in the colors that Binya Banga would have loved, with love in our heavy hearts to honor him, to celebrate him, to deeply, deeply mourn the passing of our friend, our brother, our son, our nephew. Thank you so much, Judy, and good morning to all of you. Actually, it's good afternoon. How are you? Good. I want to walk you through the day, but before I do that, I want to, I think this speaker, I want to welcome Binyavanga's family, and I want to especially welcome Binyavanga's family that has traveled here from Uganda, Karibuni, 
I know Binyabanga's family from Uganda has spent many years in Kenya in different times. Kwa hivyo mnajua vile nasema, karibuni tumefurahi mmekuja, but we are sad for the reason you're here. But I want to take the time to just walk through the schedule very quickly. We're starting now and this event is going to be made up of a combination of eulogizing, tributes, readings, and musical performances, plus some audiovisual show. And it is all meant to encapsulate as a shadow um, the fullness of Binyavanga Wainaina, the breath of him which cannot be captured in one event at one time, but it is an attempt to try and at least reflect those qualities in him to help us, as Judy has said, to honor him, remember him, and mourn him properly. We're going to be looking to end at 3 p.m. And for that to happen, all the speakers here, unfortunately, are going to be subject to rather dictatorial time limits. We all have a lot to say. If Binya was eulogizing himself, he'd probably take an hour at least. But we have to keep it short so that other people have a chance to be heard and to be able to speak their truth and their, uh, and their perceptions of where they are and the impact that Binyavanga had on them. So I'll be asking whoever knows you're going to be coming up to the podium, think in two or three minutes so that at a maximum you take five minutes. We're greatly honored with your presence here. And I want to call up the first person to do a reading, Jackie Lebo. Jackie will be reading uh, from a piece that Binyavanga asked, um, sort of rediscovered in 2017 that he had written in 19, late 1994-95 and he wrote this email to the people he asked to edit it for him or to help him edit it and I quote him, I have made the lightest of edits to this, the first short story I ever wrote in 1994. I have changed the tense to make it present tense and the main character from a guy called Jango to me. My idea before the millennium hit was that when the year 2000 came, there would be a huge rapturous event where Lucy, Africa's oldest ancestor, would come back and all ancestors would come back to live amongst their people. I called it supernatural fiction. I'm going to write it to write the centerpiece of my hip hop album, an appeal for, to all Africans to unite. Jackie? Silence. So absolute, it screamed louder than anything he had ever experienced. The sensation was terrifying. Utter nothingness surrounded him. There was no light, no darkness, nothing to feel or touch. An earthly cold imprisoned his body. He began to shake and shudder, but soon even his shudders became sluggish and eventually ceased. He was immobile. In the absolute silence, he could not tell whether he was still floating. An excruciating numbness be began to spread all over his body. Soon his body lost all feeling. He lowered his eyes to see what was happening and to his horror, saw that something was eliminating it with devastating silence, as if it had never been there. Finally, only the feeling that he, his mind was present remained and it screamed into the nothingness to make itself heard. It tried all manner of activities to convince itself that it would be all right, but waves and waves of self-doubt assaulted it as it found nothing to compare or process, nothing to perceive, not even an echo. Shutdown began in some areas of his mind, and the rest reacted by exaggerating their most recent functions. Oh shit, this is it, he thought frantically to himself. This is how it ends. 
huge, terribly distorted images thrust themselves to the front of his consciousness as it tried to resist the terrible finality of its surroundings. Now all that remained were the screams of tortured metal, flashing lights, his crazed screams, and the smell of pieces and smoke. His mind accepted this gratefully as evidence that there was existence, that he did exist. These scenes played themselves over and over as the shutdown continued and deterred, becoming more and more scrambled, indecipherable as more functions sat down. Then shut down. Then there was nothing. Something enveloped him luxuriously, light, or a beginning of awareness. Starting with his toes, he tingled with it, and it spread until every part of him glowed with its warmth. It was the strangest feeling, as if he had been recreated as light. He shaped a memory of his earthly body. Nothingness still surrounded him, but now he was a spiritual glowworm, cocooned in what he could only think of as life fire. Every part of him took flame, as his body memory emphatically affirmed and embraced his being. Tiny raptures exploded all over his mind, life thrills and memories concentrated into tiny capsules of pure feeling. Again, his recent trauma seemed to have had no major effects on him. He did not want to try and understand it. He felt so good. Thank you. Hi everyone. Um, I'm only trusting my written words today. An ode to my brother, Sweswe, Vinyavanga Wainaina. Dear Sweswe, what I wouldn't give to have you walk in, in here with that laugh of yours loud, calling out my name, saying, Chiki, Sasa. Thank you for being my amazing brother. For pushing me to be true to myself no matter what. You are so good at ordering us around to take care of ourselves and very, very bad at listening to the same advice. And we love you because you are love itself. You saw power that creativity and freedom could offer and spent your life sharing this vision with others. You taught us to find, and most importantly, to listen to our inner voice and let, that, and let that inner voice speak its truths. And even when the voice told us difficult things and we surfaced difficult conflicts that we battled within ourselves, we love you for this anyway, because you knew that love, not hate, will transform this world. You challenged us, you challenged us to push back and question institutions of power that obscure uh, the and dull us, that erase our sense of individuality, our love, our stories, hmm? our politics, and instead hate, ampli uh, hate amplifies our fears of the unknown and the unfamiliar. You fought against those small powers that make great people shadows of their true selves using hate and bigotry to fuel their existence. You pushed us to look and do things differently. But you also knew you would pay. You'd pay a heavy price for this. So you did it boldly, intensely, and very urgently. And we love you because you chose a difficult path and went through it loudly and unapologetically to open new doors, new frontiers for those who could not speak up. You are love. You gave life everything you had, and as a result, so many people and so many places have been touched by you in profound ways. What a gift you are, Sweswe. Much more than you can imagine. Not just to us as family, but to all the souls you connected with around the world. And yes, we've lost you. But we have gained a link. A link to all those who loved you. 
they have reached out to us. They have cared for us. They've no. grieved with us. They've shared with us. They've cried, they've laughed. They've told us the ways they've loved you and the ways you made them really angry only because they care deeply about you. And so we lose you, but we gain a whole movement of family who will keep your legacy alive, who will resist oppression, advance creativity to new heights. And so beyond the years that these bodies of ours can offer, you live, you live on. We got you, and in turn, you gave us family around the world. You are love, love itself. I hope to see you again, to live, laugh, hug, cry with you in another lifetime. And I hold on to all the memories of you, of Baba, of Mommy. Bye, Sue Sue. Love from Chiki. You are love itself. You taught us to love and to share this love widely and freely. Thank you. Good afternoon, um, <coughs> ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, family, friends. Thank you for joining us here today. Um, it's always, that's a hard act to follow. <laughs> But um, I'll do what I can to honor my brother. As, as you've probably noticed, um, I've had a lot of people come up to me and say, you look just like him. Um, and uh, I guess the perspectives I'll be giving you today are the perspectives of a, of a, of a sibling, of an older brother. Um, yeah. Ken taught me a number of things, and that's what I'd really like to share with you today. And. Um, as an older brother acknowledging deep and very profound lessons from my younger brother, um, I think it's fitting that I pour my heart out today in honor of him just to acknowledge the greatness of his life and the difficulty and extreme hardness of, of burying someone younger than me, uh, someone who still had so much more to give. But God's grace will continue to see me and us through. So Ken taught me about color. As you probably noticed, I have referred to his uh, memo on how to dress for such occasions with, uh, with this shirt that I'm putting on. <laughs> um, yeah, I probably wouldn't have put this on if it was any other person's event. But being Ken's, yeah, let me just scream and shout and, um, and make that statement. <laughs> Thank you, Ken. Thank you for that. And I, I promise I'm going to be a bit more daring. Um, I'm not going to change the color of my hair, though. Um, I prefer to keep things very short, sharp. I'll keep things black. But uh, le let me just adopt the shirts and occasionally the shoes as well. Thank you, Ken. So someone shared on social media the other day a little exercise, and it was a, a photo of a, a shoe, a sports shoe and it was in a fluorescent color. And under, the, under it he asked, uh, what color is the shoe? Is it green and it's celeste green um, or celeste as I'm told the Italians pronounce it, or is it pink? And so there was you know, this whole chat going on in the group with guys saying it's green, a few other guys saying it's pink. To me, the story of pink never even arose because the shoe was green. Um, and then somewhere at the bottom, you know, in terms of, you know, you know how it is, we always want to know who's right and who's wrong, um, was uh, an, an interesting sort of reflection on the feedback that we had provided. So all those guys who see it as green, apparently are left-brained, very structured, mathematical, numbers-driven animals. And all those who saw it as pink were right-brained. Um, you know, creatures very artistic, very fluid, very, very fluid, very... As my younger brother, one of the distinct privileges or honors or nuisances, as it were, is that a lot of people used to confuse me for him and him for me. Um, 
I, I guess we looked alike, um, other than a few <laughs> rather obvious nuances like color of hair. Um, we spoke alike. Uh, the intonation of our voices is very much the same. And I was sharing earlier that I remember when people would call the house in our young days, my friends would, Ken would pick up the phone and people would think it's me speaking uh, and vice versa. And, and so the imagery of left brain, the right brain was just so apt for me because I know Ken as my brother. Because I'm not right brained, artistic, etc., it's difficult for me to comprehend um, you know, that whole piece that he's done such great work on. And I know he struggled with me as well in terms of just getting, you know, this guy keeps time, he works for a corporate and he does all those other corporate things and he's always talking numbers. But despite that, green or pink, I think I had a deeper thought. The color isn't as important as the fact that it is a shoe. And on reflection, whether left-brained or life-brained, what's the most important thing is life. Life is that lowest common denominator. Life and love, as Chiki has so aptly spoken about. And one thing I will tell you is despite just the polar differences in personalities that we were, I truly love that man. He was an incredible man. And I will not forget him, ever. So thank you, Ken. Ken taught me about passion. What Ken achieved by going against the status quo and basically going to capture what I would call the artistic stroke, literary Wild West, setting up shop in domains that no one had charted before, was fantastic. You know, when you're capturing a new territory, it's easy to see the failure. It's easy not to see the vision. But Mike and the Kwani team, and Wanamaliti, uh, and the organizing committee, thank you very much for the open mic. Because one of the things that it did for me is it helped me understand. As Ken captured that wild west on the artistic scene and set up this railroad, that railroad allowed so many people a voice. And I was so touched by, you know, these young musicians who would come up and say, I never met Binya, but I found my voice. Or the other one who would say, listen, I came and I had never been validated artistically for my own interpretation of what an expression of myself from an artistic perspective should be. But Binya told me, listen, you got something there, keep going. I was so touched. Man, Ken, a man of passion, a man who believed. And all this time when I was doing my corporate thing, I didn't realize that's what you were doing. So, and I just paid tribute to you for fighting that good fight and being true to that passion. Even though you did not conform, you've given so many people uh, you know, the right to live a much fuller life. Thank you, Ken, for teaching me about passion. Boy, do I have some work to do in terms of just encapsulating that whole piece. Ken taught me about being a fighter. Now, I think it's important to understand part of our polarity is I am a sporty guy. I love to sit on my bike to play basketball. I'm in the gym, we're doing press ups and all. I don't think Ken could ever even have done one press up. Uh, the sport thing was just not him. You know, if you kind of talk sporty, you just, there's just a blank look that he had and I, I got it, you know. Um, but the fight that Ken has fought with his health, for instance, I don't have the strength to be in a locked in situation and yet you're a heart that has so much to give, wants to communicate so much, wants to share so much. I couldn't have fought 10% of the battle that Ken fought with all the different things that he needed to juggle, especially on the health side. I have learned what it takes to be a true fighter. It's not about the physicality, but it's about standing with a spirit that is strong to be true to self and to be selfless, to teach what color is, to teach what passion is. Thank you, Ken. 
can, as a fighter, you allowed your life to be a seed, a seed that you planted for the benefit of others. Kwani is such an apt representation of just that selflessness with which you gave. I had very moving tributes on the open mic about how many times Ken would uh, provide even his money for bands and for people who didn't have a voice to have a voice on the best of all platforms. Thank you, Shiro. Welcome. Let's give Shiro a round of applause. <laughs> Ken, the fighter. I have learned a lot from him. Ken taught me how to laugh unintensely because Ken didn't do anything halfway. And when Ken loved you, my God, brace yourself because that love was intense. I think there is this very stereotypical expectation that love is nice and touchy-feely and everything else like that. Ken's brand of love was tough love with instant feedback that sometimes was razor sharp and left you reeling. And it took me a long time to recognize and understand that that was his way of loving because his realities and everything that he saw, he saw for good to pull you to a different place. And I guess even listening to all the people he had interactions with, abrasive ones or genteel ones, um, it was always ultimately with a good intent in mind. Thank you, Ken for teaching me about how to love intensely, how to have that courageous conversation, and also how to recognize that sometimes tough love is, is the best dose of medicine to allow us to wake up from the complacency and comfort that we sometimes are very happy to dwell in. Ken taught me about forgiveness. Um, Ken had views, I, a lot of them I don't subscribe to, I will say, but at the end of the day, it doesn't matter to me because I don't think it's about rightness or wrongness, pinkness or greenness. At the end of the day, it's about love and it's about life. I am immensely proud to have had Ken as my brother. And for all the narratives that are out there, I really don't care, especially about the negative ones. I don't care. Ken. I loved him, and I will love him. And I will hear nothing negative about him. Absolutely not. I won't hear it. Because Ken was an amazing soul. And as my younger brother, um, I, have only, I only think the world of him. And I'm so grateful that I had the privilege of being his bigger brother. As I end, there will be a time for Thanksgiving. Uh, but I, I allow me just to say on behalf of my siblings, even as I welcome Shiro to speak. Thank you for the outpouring of messages, the outpouring of support, um, the reaching out that so many of you have done uh, towards Shiro, towards Chiki, towards myself and the bigger family. Thank you for that. It is difficult to convey beyond very heartfelt uh, words that we are all sharing now just how deeply we have been touched by everything. Thank you to Dr. Ikimani, Judy, Shiba, um, and uh, Angela, and the rest of the core team of people who have walked this journey with us, who have given us the space to, to, to breathe and to mourn and to come to this point of, of finality, and yet also taken up you know, a lot of the organizational uh, challenges and bits and pieces in terms of making this event together. Thank you for even finding us this venue. It is such a tribute to Ken. It is just so reflective of the fresh air, the birds, the nature. It, it, it just reflects. So for all of you who have come from far, from wide, from Uganda, Hannah from the US, um, you know, Chris Lowe, um, my, my boss and very good friend, and the Lechego team, and all of you who have come, we're really humbled. We are really touched. We really say from the bottom of our hearts, thank you. Ken, you're the man. I love you forever, no matter what. Ladies and gentlemen, please, a warm round of applause for my sister, Julie.
Okay, so I've been a crying baby for a lot of my life. My brother Ken was so close to me, huh? Close. We were like twins. Ah, and of course, you know, when you're close like that, the wars are also phenomenal, right? So, I just. Because if you give me the microphone, I can talk the whole day. Um, first of all, I'm happy. I'm happy because all of you are here. I'm even happier because in this world of convention and rules, um, Ken broke them all. From when he was lit and did some really interesting things. Like, we didn't have a weighing scale, you know, the scale for Pima in that you find in the gym. But we didn't have that, but we had a kitchen scale, right? A chuma chuma kitchen scale. So Brilliant can, you know, put his head on it, measure his head, put his arm on it, measure his arm. Yeah, and then added them all up and figured out he knew how heavy he was. He had, he had his quirks of brilliance and, um, like any sibling that's that close to you in age I, I i loved him with fierceness and when we were pissed off with each other it was phenomenal and he loved me he loved me and i know that he loved me better than he loved anyone in the world there's nothing nothing sweeter than that eh? you know what i mean so i won't say much I'll just remind all of you that the person we're saying goodbye to has been so many things to so many people. And the way that it is with family, yeah? You know, they call me Shiro June because there are so many Shiros. There are 12 of us, so I'm Shiro June. And not everyone is allowed to call me Shiro anyway, okay? So some of you know me as Claire. You can deal with that. Um, Ken? over the last 15, 20 years has been Uncle Ken. He's Uncle Ken because his nephews know him as Uncle Ken. And he loved them with fierceness, fierceness. He took care of them in so many ways that I may not always have approved of, you know, like when he bought someone an iPad that cost 35K. What was it, an iPod? 35K, okay. Um, you do not buy a child of a certain age an iPod that costs 35K he did he did that sort of thing he indulged you um, he indulged you with indulgence you know if I have a lot of funky stuff in my wardrobe it's because wherever uncle Ken went he would just get you stuff you know he was he was that uncle so of course over the last few weeks I mean he was in hospital for a while he had two brain surgeries I'm probably not supposed to say this, but I must. He, he, he had a hard head. And after brain surgery number one, uh, I tell you no lie, like for real. I'm up at 1 a.m. I hand over to Melissa. We are standing waiting for brain surgery to end. Who has brain surgery? He had brain surgery. Yeah. And the next morning he was already talking. Yeah. Kichangumu. Nicely. So, um, yeah, we miss him and we thank everyone and we thank the people that are often not thanked, the team at Aga Khan Hospital, who took such good care of him. It was sometimes annoying because I, I couldn't see him because, you know, they're behind the curtain preserving his dignity. And uh, I know that those last few moments that we were privileged to share with him, those quite a bunch of us in there. There was family and there were close friends. I know that the team at Aga Khan ICU did more than their fair share, yeah, over the last eight weeks and in those final moments. And allow me to say with, with love and with humor, it was those you're waiting for the code blue, you know, yeah. And Binya was probably just watching us from some in-between space. Of course, he was unconscious, but I know he knew. Who 
has friends like Binyahad? Who has friends who, Yani, husband and wife are both friends of his and love him intensely? Like we had um, amazing people. June and Kema, um, who I know over the years have been more of his family than we have. Yeah? So thank you, June. Thank you, Kema. Those that were wailing uh, louder than I ever can. Chimamanda, Yvonne, those who are not here themselves, you know, to be here with us. We we saw him off in that, you know, it's a movie, it's a cold blue, they go behind the curtain, you don't know what they're doing, but you can hear the machines and they come back and they say, we're trying to resuscitate him, so yeah, like serious, like movie action, you know, so he appreciated those last moments because it gave him all the dignity that he needed and when he's there, Uko in heaven, writing that final novel, yeah, it'll have all that drama because... His life was drama, color, beauty, and love. So thanks again for all coming out. And yeah, I'll keep crying, but they're really just happy tears. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll, I'll see Binya in heaven, because I'm Catholic like that, and I did the needful. I did, you know what I mean. So we'll all be together in a happy place in years to come but even as we are here he's here he's here with us thank you god bless you all In terms of what we're going to do now is I'm going to have the privilege of uh, inviting members of the, uh, the Wainaina family, uh, maybe from Kunjuguna and Kukiara, please come to the podium uh, and maybe say a few words on, on behalf of the Wainaina family. As, as that happens, I will ask uh, Uncle Gerald and Uncle Chris if you could be on standby because you will have the opportunity to do so. Um, obviously, we have a long schedule ahead of us, so we will we'll leave you to, to speak. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Jogona Wainaina, and this is my big brother, Kiara Wainaina. We are both uh, brothers of um, uh, Ken's dad. Uh, so Ken's dad uh, was, was our brother. He's gone, and uh, he was not only a brother, he was a close, close friend. But we are here to, today to pay tribute to Ken, and probably to give you a perspective, our, our own perspective as parents of Ken, or Binyavanga. And, um, and, and, I, and I'll just take a very short time, and I'll tell you the one thing that stuck to me throughout the time that I knew Ken was that he was a truly, um, I don't know, I don't know whether the, the word is brave. It, it, it's only, it, it's, it's possibly a reckless uh, determination to do things that are not done by other people. And that I adored. I really, really admired that very, very much. I'll, let me give you a few examples. When he was, um, many years ago, when he was a very little boy, when he was a very small boy, our youngest sister was getting married. I, I was in the lineup. I was a young man myself, and I was in the lineup, and there was a whole lot of people, you know, brides, bridesmaids, and all that, as you, you, you know. So we walking into church, and Ken uh, decided, he had to be in that, although he was not, he was not scheduled. He was not, he was not in the program, but he joined. And uh, of course, uh, there was a little disruption. I think, where is he? He had not been in the uh, 
rehearsals and so forth, but he joined anyway. And, 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 and he was accommodated. And he went, and throughout the church service, he was, um, he sat there like everybody else. And, and that was something. You know, for a little boy to feel, I need to be part of that, and I'm going to be part of that, and he was part of that. And that, that may look like a little thing, but it's a, it's a big thing to my mind. Let me also tell you that, again, when he was a teenager, I don't know how many of, of you that knew Kent then, he was a young man. He had a production at the National Theatre of a play. It was a, we all went. And you know, and, and Ken was, uh, he was the, I think the main character, he was the main actor. But even at the end of it all, everybody was asking, what, what was that about? <laughs> nobody, nobody could figure out what the whole thing was about, but there he was. Now, uh, in the 90s, when Ken was in university in South Africa, I happened to be working in South Africa myself. And um, so from time to time, we'd speak on the phone. Shiro, Shiro would call me. They were both in university in South Africa, but they were in KwaZulu Natal, and I lived in Johannesburg. So, so from time to time, Shiro would come around and see us. And I'd always ask Shiro, Wait, where is Ken? Why, why does Ken not come? You know, you'd expect a student to come to see his uncle uh, to try and get the usual things that <laughs> students need to get from their uncles. Anyway, but Ken would call me from time to time and say, oh, uncle, I'll come and see you, I'll come and see you, but he never did. Then one night, he called me and uh, he said, uncle, I want to, to pick your brain. He said, go ahead. Can you tell me Remind me again how to cook githeri. And I'm like, is it night? Where, where is this coming from? So we had a chat and I told him what I knew of cooking githeri. I'm not an expert. It turns out Ken had been commissioned by a local newspaper, I think in Guazulu Natal, to write about African cooking. And, and he he decided, he decided he had to write about cooking there, which he knew absolutely zero about. But, uh, but anyway, we, we had a discussion and he came up, he, he brought out this piece that was published and he carried on. Uh, at that time, I did not realize that he would become the writer, the, the great fiction writer or whatever his writing is described as. Uh, but he did, uh, I, I didn't realize it. So it, got, it, was, it was surprising when he started to write these books. And I asked him, when did you write, realize you could write? And he said, but how, I, I, am, I owe my inspiration, to, uh, uh, please Rebecca, just if, if you can start. No. No. Rebecca is our eldest sister, and she, uh, she's a, you know, and she she, used, she she started writing when she was a young lady, a young a young lady in Makere many years ago. So Ken had read her her work, and he said she inspired me to want to write. Now. Of course, Ken now took writing to another level because now, uh, with greatest respect to my sister, uh, Ken became well known around the world. I, 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 I'm surprised. You know, every time I, I saw his work and I saw the reviews of his work, I'd get so surprised because I'd say, my goodness, he's done it again. He's, these people respect him this much? This is a little boy that was joining the train, the, the wedding train, the other day. This is a boy that I know. So that was a, that was the greatness of, of, of Ken. But now, so, so I remember, I remember those incidents with, with, a, with a lot of fondness. And, and let me tell you something else. 
came as a family, we came from a fairly conservative, stuck up family, uh, Christian. Not, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with being Christian, but very, very conservative. So some of the things that Ken was doing were challenging to us. You know, they would, they would, they were like, my goodness, wait, wait, what's all this about? But you know, it started me thinking. And it gave me a, a real, in fact, I thank Ken because it made me start to think a bit more broadly than I used to think. And now when I see people that say this or say that and the negativity that I hear, I just feel so sorry for them because they are so closed up. So, I want to say this. I, as I've, I've thought and thought and I struggled and struggled and I came and I said to myself, I accept Ken for the genius that he is, for the nephew that he is. And I'll give you, and I'll tell you, and I, and, and it started me thinking, and I thought to myself, so some of us, we are born right-handed. Others are born left-handed. The majority around the world are right-handed. So I started to say to myself, does that mean that anyone who's left-handed, is something wrong with them? Is that, is that what we are about as a people? That we have to cast aspersions on anyone that is different from us? Um, I, I, I decided my mind is a little more open. I'm probably a little better because of being Ken's uncle and therefore being close to him and seeing all the things that he did. We appreciate Ken as a family. We truly, I am truly proud that he took the name, uh, the name Wainaina around the world, you know, he's, he's, he's known every, everywhere in the world, you know, in Canada, in the US, in different universities, and he's got many, many friends. I, I am truly grateful that Ken was born in our family. Thank you, thank you very much. The siblings of uh, Ken in Avanda Wainaina, fellow mothers. My names are Chris in Yavanga, the Kezi, and with me is Gerald Kagame in Yavanga. We are the maternal uncles of Ken. And with us, we've come with our children. If I would like, I would like to ask them to stand up and be recognized, please. The Brenda group. Thank you, you can sit down. Now, I'm not the one supposed to be here. Ken is much bigger than that. Our chairman, Professor Charles Kamanzi, is in South Africa and he has a sick wife, so he was not able to travel, although he has spoken to the Wainainas almost all of them to the person. So he asked me to stand in for him, and I stand here, I'm in bigger shoes than mine. I'm the younger brother to Charles, and this is my youngest brother here. So, our association with the Wainainas goes a long way. I was a small boy like this, now it's only that all my hair has disappeared, but it used to be gray. 
But now the grey has also fallen off. That is how long our association with the Wainainas has been. My sister Rosemary, whom I also call my mother because she brought both of us up. Actually, we are also part of the Wainaina. We, we are okay, Ugandans, but we grew up. We were. We grew up in a very difficult time of Idamin. So my sister saw we could probably be in trouble. We probably would have been, especially me. Uh, so she decided to cleverly withdraw us from Uganda and bring us to Nakuru. Ken, Jimmy, and Shiro. This little one who was here making noise was not even there. <laughs> she was not even there. I came to meet her when I was somewhere else. I had my own family at that time. She was a late comer, but she spoke. She spoke mostly, I so. So that's how the Binyavanga family started. Now we were also sucked into the Wainaina family, and they brought us up under very difficult. So Ken was born in my hand, basically. I carried him, I bathed Ken. I know him from a long way. But you know, he was always a fast man. And probably that's why he decided to go ahead of me. He overtook me in the race. I'm supposed to have gone before him. And there he is. He has gone ahead of me. Another Ken character. Now, it's very difficult sometimes to talk after all these able speakers have spoken. But as Binyavanga family, we have special attachments to Ken. Ordinarily, I would have come here and said, listen, they have said everything that they should have said about Ken, and I concur. And you clap for me, and I walk away. <laughs> but I'm not going to concur on everything. I'm going to tell you, Cain had such a gift. One, okay, maybe because he was also a Binyavanga. In fact, he's more known as Binyavanga than <laughs> One one night I was listening to BBC, and I, there was this Muzungu man. Binyavanga. I said, Binyavanga on BBC? I never knew any of us who could. Then we added later, why nine? I knew to He took our name throughout the world. What Uncle Njuguna was saying here was the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Ken took both our names, the why niners. Binyavanga, I mean Binyavanga Wainaina, in that order. Throughout, <laughs> the, throughout the world. He didn't only do that, Ken kept on checking on the Binyavanga in the foothold. He always made sure at every occasion whether somebody, I think he even came for, somebody had given birth in our family and Ken drove with the Shiro. And they drove all the way. It's about two days or three days, I think, on the way, and they came. That's how he made us united, the unity that we have, which we, I don't think it will ever end. Our unity will end with the world. But Ken highlighted it. He made sure, yes, we are here. As much, we, 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 we are with you in good times, in bad times, the latest. When Ken was actually, he, you know, nobody expected him to come, but he came anyway. That's why he's Ken. He flew all the way. We had lost our eldest brother-in-law where my sister was married, in Kigali. Ken took a flight in under difficult terms. He had already been hit, I think, by a stroke, and he came. 
everybody was moved. Please give Ken a clap. He never missed any occasion. My parents is dead. His grandfather, Binyapanga, when he died, Ken came. He made sure there was no gap of the Binyapanga. One is going down, another one is coming down. So Ken filled the virtue that we had failed, and he was all over us, you know, telling us something. He always had something for everyone at whatever age. He would come to you and make sure that you feel very, very good about what is happening, whether it is bad or good. So, as much as we feel bad about the early departure of Ken, we also celebrate his life. We celebrate his life that in the short span of time he's been on earth. He has achieved more than we, the elder ones, will ever be able to achieve. And forever we'll be grateful to him because he has left a legacy that nobody will be able, very few people will be able to feel. This can here, I told you we came in touch with him when he was a young man. So sometimes it was, he became a difficult person for me. I mean, because he's called Binyamal. And so is my father. So when he was a kid, of course he would do his own uh, old manyanga, like joining those lines, eh, which you heard about. But he even used to do worse. Eh? And it was very difficult to discipline. Ask me why. <laughs> How do I go and say, Wee! You stupid doing your vanga here. My friend, that was my father. <laughs> <laughs> so he's always been an elder to me, a son, a nephew. I miss him in all those capacities. And so does the Vinyavanga family wherever they are. And that's what my brother wanted me to say to you people. That as much as we have lost him, let's celebrate him. And we are also very, very proud. I want now to say I concur with Uncle Njuguna for saying it. We are proud that he came and he carried our name. He didn't carry my uncles. He became my father. So we are so, so proud of him, of his achievements in such a little time that it could only be Ken who could achieve that. And maybe because he carried the Vinyavanga or Inaina names, I think. So, thank you very much for listening to us. I would like to, to, to I'd like to pass on the microphone to my younger brother to introduce the children we came with. Please, Gerald, introduce yourself first, and then introduce everybody. I'm Gerald Kagame. I'm number 10 in the family. We are 12 in the family. Same father, same mother. It was a large family. But I also grew up in Nakuru, working in Masai Land, and I, we have gone through a lot with the, my siblings. Much as I'm an uncle, um, those are my siblings. We had some mischief with, uh, yeah. Um, I won't say a lot, because much has been said. Ken was a very quiet man, but mischievous. Uh, so I'll introduce the two people who came in uh, now. Uh, Brenda Dechesi, is Dechesi, is a daughter to my brother. Henrietta Kagame is my firstborn. She, she has been working with Unilever Uganda. Now she has been transferred 
to Unilever Kenya. So she is part of Kenya. So you see, we are moving Uganda, Kenya. <laughs> the other person is Kelvin Kurie. Things are starting. Uh, I don't know where she uh, end, but Korea picked an interest in Henrietta Kagame. So next Friday they are coming to Uganda to also make another bond to the Kenyans. So we are. And I assure you, things are going to work out. So. You are all welcome when we come to Kenya also to celebrate another Ugandan in Kenya. So, thank you very much. So I needed to end from here. And say we shall continue praying with you and for our son. His spirit is never forgotten. Thank you very much. And uh, I'm supposed to murder her. And uh, Binyavanga and I used to play a lot of practical tricks on each other. So to make the performance realistic, I actually strangled him. <laughs> and he couldn't breathe. <laughs> <laughs> and that play, we performed it first inspired by Binya in the school. And we thought we owned the play because we had written it and performed it ourselves. So we had a difference of opinion with the administration. And we were informed that, so we said we want to take it professional. We don't want this amateur stuff. Like the national school festival, we wanted to go professional. We also wanted to earn money. So, and Binyavanga and I had a lot of financial plots in high school, which never worked out. And we were a group of us, and the teachers told us if we take this play to perform it outside the school, we'll be suspended. And so we decided we had to take the risk. But first we wanted to talk to our parents, because if we were suspended, we'd be in trouble. And we all went our separate ways and asked our parents. I don't know who Binya asked, but we got permission and our parents said, you go ahead. If they suspend you, that's okay. And so Binya had that support from his family, which we appreciate a lot. Thank you so much for your touching words. No gathering is complete without music. Where there's been a wonder, there's color, there's laughter, there's tears, but there's Times. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> perform <laughs> Hello everybody. We're missing our guitar player. Oh. Yes. I was about to have a heart attack. Um, as uh, the great Kenyan music connoisseur.
Mr. Gray. Now, I want to invite up uh, one of Binyabanga's closest friends, uh, Paselelo Kantai, uh, to give a tribute and to read a tribute. Pasa. Greetings, everyone. Um, I've got two tributes to read, um, and then I'll, I'll read my own. So the first one, which I've just uh, received, um, is from the National Librarian of Norway, somebody called Aslak Sira Myri, and he writes, I don't feel it's proper of me to intrude in the morning of Binyavanga's close family and friends. And I don't know how the memorial on Thursday will be and what is proper there either. I did not know Binyavanga well the last couple of years. Our ships didn't cross too often, unfortunately. But I loved him so much. My children loved him and still remember him even though 
It's years since they saw him. And his friends in Norway loved him. So it is fitting in any context and called for, uh, for me to say the following. Binyavanga is no more, and we are at a loss. His deeply original mind, his improvising character, his fast tongue, and his beautiful and sharp pen will be missed for years to come. Binyavanga came to Norway for the first time 10 years ago and left us in laughter, awe, and surprise. He left with friends who stayed with him for years, for Binyavanga was not just one of the most interesting people I have met. Intellectually, interesting people can be unpleasant. They get praised too much. But Binyavanga was also caring, loving, and kind. And chaos, not to mention chaos. I worked raising money for, for the pilgrimage, pilgrimages project some nine years ago. Chaos is a good word for that experience. But in the heart of Binyavanga's chaos and his brilliance was a man it was almost impossible not to love. His writing will be missed by people all over the world who never met him. His hugs, his laughter, and his flawful mind, flawful human nature will be missed by everyone who knew him. The second tribute I will read is by is from Ed Pavlich, who is a poet and a friend that met with Binyavanga um, in the early 2000s. Binyavanga Wainaina, I never knew nor knew of a person more powerfully and crucially and lovingly and locally and globally and strugglingly and playful, pleasuringly a part of this world we share. So sad he's gone from here and he isn't. So blessed and thankful to have been here with him and along with all the people he made known to me. Binya, my brother, my traveling partner, my teacher, my friend, love always, love life, love each other. So those are the tributes uh, I was given to read. And um, I've been struggling trying to write mine. Um, because there was so much to say. And yet at the heart of what I wanted to, what I've been struggling with was the question of what was the what was the bigness, what was the significance, what was the meaning of this man. I met Binyavanga in 2002. Um, he was, I was given uh, a set of pieces from uh, a mutual friend, Ali Zaidi. Uh, who called me up. I was working, I was working um, with a magazine. And Ali Zaidi, who was working uh, at the East African, called me up and tells me, uh, look, you're always looking for writers. Um, here's, here's a bunch of pieces you might want to look at. So I checked out these pieces, and they were astonishing. And I mean that because, you know, in the context of um, Kenya, especially Nairobi journalism and media of the late 90s, early 2000s, it was tough getting decent writers. Forget about really good ones. But the stuff that came to me was on a level that I had never seen. Uh, it was, you know, it's talent. I mean, the people who, you see flashes of it, you see bits of it. You can even see an entire, you know, when, you're, when you're an editor, you get very cynical. <laughs> so you can see, you know, you, you get a piece and you're like, you know, here we go. It's just going to be got more work. But these pieces were complete. They didn't need, they didn't need work. And not just that, they had something extra, which really excited me. Now, this is around the time um, of the Kane Prize. 
which I never heard of. So I called this man, didn't know who, who he was, but Ali had told me, oh, you know, he talks a lot, so when you call him, you know, make sure you, you, you're prepared. So I called the guy up and we start talking and we don't stop. And I, we want to meet. But he tells me, oh, I was going for, um, I can't meet because uh, I'm off to London. I've been nominated for a prize. It's called the Kane Prize. It's like, okay, um, I don't know what that is. Uh, a few days later, um, the prize is being broadcast live on radio, on the BBC. And I found myself rooting for this guy I'd never met. And it was incredible because they didn't announce the prize immediately. I had to wake up in the morning to find out. And when you know, I discovered that the guy had won, I mean, it's a complete stranger, pretty much. I was, com I was really, really affected. I thought this was something really special. So that's how, let me say, that's how we started. Six weeks later, he was back in Nairobi. And we went to meet, um, I picked him up. We agreed to meet, picked him up. And we went to um, Ali Zaidi's house. Ali Zaidi, for me, was a mentor. Um, he'd given me my first uh, job as a journalist. And um, we were good friends. So we go to Ali's house. And Pinya is, um, as you can imagine, very talkative, uh, going on about all kinds of things at the same time. At some point, I think he told me that he thought I was uh, some kind of uh, KWS ranger or something <laughs> because I work for an environmental magazine. <laughs> and um, anyway, we get to Ali's house. And, you know, Ali had this, uh, I don't know whether he's here. It would be great if he was here because he tells his story better than anybody else. But Ali's house was one of the few kind of open houses in Nairobi. You, you just, you gave him a call, you told him you were coming, and you just went there and you, you hang out at this place. Binyavanga begins talking about everything and anything. But we're talking books, we're talking politics, we're talking literature, you know, the whole world. And that's pretty much, um, I would say, that's pretty much the beginning of the Kwani project. Because within no time at all, we had already gathered all kinds of other people there. And Binya had, you know, he clearly had an agenda because he had a tape recorder. And he started recording people. And, um, well, I later kind of figured out that this was part of his whole uh, discovering home kind of project. So he says, you know, been living in South Africa, I'm back home, I want to figure out what's going on in this place. And he starts interviewing people um, who are friends, friends of ours, who, uh, a lot of them journalists, some artists, filmmakers, and people start talking about things that they never really discussed. New possibilities, new ways of doing things. It's an incredible moment, um, also because this was 2002. In 2002, there was this sense, if you can remember, of a kind of growing euphoria. You know, the Moi must going moment was actually here. And um, I'd say that that's how that garden, Ali's back garden, is where, is where Kwani really started. And it became something that I've never seen since in Nairobi, which was a kind of a kind of bonding, a kind of I mean what what I could even call a kind of age of love. There was such optimism, there was such love, and there was such hope for something new, an adventure. And that adventure meant that there were people who 
had worked in the corporate world, there were people who were working in NGOs and the UN and so on, people who were quitting their jobs to become writers because of Binyavanga. Binyavanga seemed to have just sparked this idea, this feeling in people that what you're doing is not enough. You need to reach deeper and you need to soar higher. And people went for it. I mean, it was almost like a, a, like a kind, like a religious moment. This is where Kwani started. Now, over the next um, decade, um, I think Kwani did incredible things. Most the inspiration of it for a long time. Um, other people came in, Billy, Angela, and so on. Um, but the identity of Kwani and Binya, the association, was obviously a permanent thing, as we know today. Following that, uh, we were friends. And, and by that I mean that we actually lived in the same compound together. Uh, we shared many things, uh, including um, when I go back to this whole idea of discovering home, which is where Kwani had started. Binyavanga extended the idea of home beyond um, where he was, where he lived and where he had settled. Home for him was the entire continent and it was a curiosity to find out stuff that um, perhaps we had lost, perhaps we didn't know, histories, people, encounters. So he was traveling all the time and you know our conversations um, for a long time, for a decade, I'd even say a decade and a half, were fueled by this 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 um, curiosity to look to figure out exchange notes about what the continent was, um, the people we were encountering. I mean, we were many things, including being um, together with Martin. I'd say a trio of brothers. And we're not always in sync. We're not always um, in agreement but who were brothers who were fused together by this incredible moment, this incredible encounter that had come with Binyavanga returning home and us meeting him. Um, one of the most touching, I think one of the things that I will always carry um, was 2011, uh, Binyavanga's book uh, comes out and he's launching it in Nairobi. And he writes, my friend, my mentor, my introducer to Kenya. Thank you for all you've done for me. Too many things to start. Thank you for your love, its consistency. When I was Bonyoka, I can't wait to open your book. With much love, Binya. He also adds, we'll find those Karen and London days again. My brain feels stale without them. Thanks. Thank you, Pasa. Uh, before I invite the next speaker, I just wanted to recommend there's somebody who's not here called Brian Kamanzi. And Brian uh, has written a, an essay in the Mail and Guardian from a few years ago called, or I, I don't know if it's from a few years ago, How to Write About Binyavanga. So if you're on your phone during one of the breaks, there's Google how to write about Binyavanga by Brian Kamanzi and you will see that in fact Binya, as I'm learning more and more this morning, was really actually from a family of people with an artistic um, talent. Let me invite Vincent Njoroge, who first met Binyavanga at Lenanas to me, um, um, to read from Myrtle Jones was a friend of Binya's from New York. Binya. I intentionally emphasized the ya. Saying his name this way 
forces me to keep my mouth open and breathe out air. Binya, whom I affectionately called my pumpkin, advocated for everyone to breathe out full breaths. The kind of breath that reminds you of God's love and the love all around. Binya exuded love even when he was flaming you on social media. His intensity was grounded in his love and fierce advocacy for love and staunch battle against anything that stood in its way. He fought for love so hard because he knew what a love deferred and a love denied felt like. He was able to see and experience love in words, images, sounds, movement, faces, and places. He connected people all over the world, all over the globe, with love as his aim. During his more cogent moment, although not physically there, I hope in the midst of our sadness, we find a way to dance and with mouths open to breathe out and take in full breaths. Ah, thank you. That was much enjoyed. Bino's my friend and I'll miss him. Um, we met in the Nana School, A Levels 1988. And as you can tell and you can hear today, Bina made enduring friendships, deep friendships through the years. Um, I want to pass my condolences to his family, all of his friends from our family, from Ramsey, from my son Singemi and daughter Tandeka, who loved Binya, from my sisters and brothers. I also send condolences from our schoolmates, our classmates, uh, who have sent their condolences as well. Um, I think one of the things we all took from Binya is, and I as you heard from the story uh, uh, that uh, Balozi gave about the school play, just the audacity, the craziness of being able to do a play in school and then go out and say you want to perform it at Allianz. I mean, you know, it was just nuts. We thought it was nuts. And a few of us, because it was so secret, got a chance to go and see. And, and that, was, that was amazing. So the enduring lesson was, why not? And I think that's how he took things. That's what he taught us. It's like, why not? In 2014, he asked me to be on a project with him. And um, I'm, I'm the corporate guy among these creatives, you know. <laughs> and so you can imagine the excitement after what he's done with Kwan Yim. And the reason was he wanted to create a digital platform. And it was about Afrofuturism, and he needed it to be continent-wide. And it was an amazing vision. It was exciting to be, you know, kind of involved in something like that. But by then, as you know, he'd had a stroke in 2011. Um, it, things were becoming to be, year after year, more of a struggle. And for someone who's known him for a long time and all the amazing things, he's done, I know it was really, uh, not just for me, but all his friends, this was a really difficult thing to see. But at the same time, it was also amazing to see how strong and how hard he fought through something that was unimaginable. A stroke that takes your ability to speak for Binya. I mean, so, we're all incredibly sad uh, today um, and it's been tough and I know for the family it's been incredibly tough these last few years um, but we're here to, um, to, to honor and Binya want to say to you, you know, rest well, uh, we love you and uh, you know, you won't be forgotten. Who couldn't come but wanted to, to share his condolences he says, I met him in various places, Leeds, New York, Stockholm, Nairobi, and once in my home in Rironi, Kenya. 
and at his father's home in Nairobi. I saw him mesmerize audiences with histories, his charisma. I wrote a preface to his memoir. One day I will write about this place. And he did indeed write about this place with his creative essays, his activism, and his impact on the literary scene in Kenya and Africa. He will be forever associated with the Kwani generation of African writers who include his friends Chimamanda, Chim Chimamanda Adichie and Billy Kahora and others. Who really was Binyavanga Wainaina? He was simply a literary force of nature and he will always be a part of our lives.